So I'm so I'm David Bronner. I am mainly I would say a designer. Um, and I was born in uh, I was born in Toulouse in the south of France, uh, which is a city uh, that you may know. Um, I think it's mostly fa famous for rugby. Uh, and heavy food and stuff like this. Not so much for the design scene. I mean, in France, I think the design scene is only in, happening in Paris anyway. Um, and so I think, you know, when I when I look back at, um, you know, the reason why I started doing this job as a designer and mainly focusing on interactive experience and all of this, but I think the main uh, thing that attracts me is like design in general was um, that's, I so on the left you can see that this is where I was born and I 10 years old this is where I moved and I think this is something that really struck me at that time which was that there were um on the, so you can see like a, a nice house I mean what I think was a nice house and on the right what I think was like not such a nice building and I think this is, you know, looking back, this is what really made me think about that the fact that there were decisions made at some point who could change um, a lot the way we experience the world. And even though I didn't become an architect, um, I think this is kind of what always uh, remained in me when I was designing. And so um, also at that time, I think I started being very interested in uh, animation and uh I I was very lucky to be exposed to a lot of uh, experimental animation as a young uh, kid, because my my grandpa was recording um, something called the Night of Animation on some kind of cultural channel, TV channel in, in France, and so you can see here some really weird things happening. At that time, I didn't really understand what was it, but um, I feel like seeing like more um, you know experimental experimentation around what could be just a normal movie. Um, normal, normal animation movie also made me, I think, uh, really thought about, made me think about how you can turn something a little boring into something completely different and amazing. And that not, not necessarily has like a meaning, but can also revolve around the idea of the absurd. And so that was, I, I think this movie especially really stuck in me. And I think it's kind of interesting here because if you see that scene here, which we, which is the end of the movie, when you have this, uh, this almost like uh, cubes getting into the this half ball, and then uh, I realized way after that this is a project that I've created a teaser for Gary Lafayette, which was like very similar, and I think this is about the moment where I realized how my childhood really impacted the way I was working. And, you know, uh, the, that's kind of a fun one, I think. And even the blue, I mean, in the video before in animation, you cannot really see the, the saturation of the blue sky, but I think this blue sky as well restruck in me. And I think the whole thing about DVTK when we started in 2015 was very about almost like, you know, doing a utopian, like what doing to digital, what utopian architecture was to architecture. Um, and so, um, let's say I, I put this here because when I arrived in this, uh, in this kind of ugly building when I was young, I, I think the first thing that, uh, I wanted was, you know, how can I make this space a better looking place? And as a kid, like 10 years old or something like this, I started, uh, spending all my money into like what was, um, um, you know, the design scene, <laughs> I mean, the design, anything that I could get. And so uh, I think IKEA for me uh, was uh, like an endless resource of possibilities because it was uh, affordable. And because then suddenly I was going from like the typical very basic, like ugly design that was just like given to me. And I could, I could just spend a little bit of money and like 10 euro or something and have something that looks a little better. And um, so then I, I went to, um, to applied art school and I see. I think I was like fourteen years old because in France you can uh, you can go to um, some kind of technical school where you, you you learn about applied art. 
And I discovered, uh, this is an example of um, a magazine that I was uh, subscribed, it's called Intramuros in France. And this is um, Ron Arad on the left and one of his chair on the right. And I think this also um, really made me realize that a chair doesn't have to be just a normal chair, but we can do everything with design. And um, it's interesting as well because this, uh, so this is like then in applied art, I was like learning all about guys on the pitch or like anything that that is more like, you know, um, speculative design, let's say. On the right, you can see, I think it's a British uh, designer called Daniel Vale who did like this deconstructed radio. And I was like, wow, like a radio doesn't have to be what we think is the radio. We can also deconstruct the box and like just take the components and connect them together. And I think basically that was the, the background, uh, uh, my background in terms of design for when I started designing anything for myself. And those were actually the slides that I was showing for a presentation, I think it was at Wolf Olins in 2015, uh, trying to explain what was our you know, um, approach with DVTK, which was like, okay, we have this chair, but it, this chair doesn't have to be just like this. We can also create like any sort of stuff. And I think at that time we were really into like fighting against the two templatized world of digital design. And at that time, I, I mean, today it's actually amazing what, what everyone is doing in terms of w web experiences. Back in the day, it wasn't the case. Also because um, the, te the technical aspect of building a website was much more, yeah, much more of a barrier, let's say. Um, yeah, so I think that it that was the trigger, I would say, for uh, that. That's basically, I think, gives a bit of a context about um what uh why I started doing what I do and then um then I was uh actually so I kept going I went to Paris to uh, study um study visual communication but I didn't really like it so I went to 3D studies and uh, actually maybe I can show a little bit I I started doing like um um 3D animation so that was like one of the my first degree, like after one year of 3D animation, I started doing like this. Uh, and you can see this character is like being like all absorbed in his world with like many objects around him. And I think that also is kind of a reflection of like what I was dreaming about when I was young with this guy as well. And then I I kept going with like doing more uh, like a, this is like a group movie, which was like a, a Japan horror movie movie. Um, and then I think that was the very was actually a very important uh, moment for me because that was the first time I was learning hard skills. And so from there, I I learned how to do like you know modeling. I mean scenario, sound design, modeling, uh, what we call rigging in three D, which is making the skeleton of any character or anything, and then lighting, rendering. And I actually specialized in rendering and compositing. And I worked in a couple of post production studio in Paris. And I really felt like I wasn't really made for working for anyone really in the company. So I, yeah, I slowly started to be like more of a freelancer. And by luck, I started working a lot with fashion, um, fashion brands. And I think it was the early years of, um, of 3D being used for fashion editorials and stuff like this. So I had the chance to work with Daniel Sandwald and some like photographers that were like pioneering the use of CGI. Um, for fashion um and and then um i was so my partner at that time was working at kenzo and we started doing like a lot of interactive editorials for kenzo did like virtual galleries and stuff like this and after having done this for like maybe i don't know two years and did like maybe 20 different uh, digital experiences then we decided to do the same thing for other brands and we moved to london to create dvtk and so that's and then we, I think we kept going for eight years. Um, and now, now I'm, 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 I just open office runner. Um, and I think, I guess the, the idea is, um, a bit, I mean, we have the same service, which is, you know, we do like, uh, anything digital from, uh, mainly like digital design and, um, let's say, um, in user interface app. Uh, and all of this, but with a crossover with CGI, which allows uh, allows us to not only do flat interfaces, but also sometimes create the content when it when the content has to be in three D, but also like just basically push the what is possible to do in an interactive way on a website. 
Um, and I guess that is the kind of utopian part of my work. It's, it's like we can do like a really beautiful editorial, editorialized layout, but what if we also do a little bit of something like a twist that can make it uh, a little bit more exciting and maybe memorable, at least that's what I'm, I'm saying to my clients. Um, so maybe I can go through the, I don't know, the recent work uh, that I've worked on with Office Brunner and uh, if that's okay with you. Perfect. Okay, cool. So actually I worked, the first project uh, I've done for, uh, for Goat was their Black Friday campaign. But I think that this one is somehow uh, also pretty interesting. That's the second project I've just finished. Um, I think it was uh, like two, a month ago. And so Goats, you know, they have this thing of like they are a retail platform. You may know them, uh, but it's like everything's happening on digital and they have no brick and mortar shop. So they obviously have this issue of like having to give some tangibility to their product. And so they have to create editorial content and all of this. And so for that one, they made this selection around futurism. And so they briefed me with like many inspiration images and like those futurist, um, futurist uh, looks. And they were like, okay, we need to create this editorial. We need to create content, but we have literally two weeks and a half or something, two, three weeks. And uh, we know we want to use 3D and all of this. So I, I was like, okay, that sounds like a very tight timeline. And so from there, I started doing like a lot of research around more real-time 3D. And I um, managed to convince them that, we. I mean, actually they were pretty easy to convince because GOT are not at all about like making like ultra realistic rendering and all of this because they feel like everyone's doing that anyway. And so they they were super keen to explore more like you know very low fee let's say 3d which were and then i realized that what i could do is because we had only two two weeks to deliver all the content was to use unreal engine which i've never used before which is like a real-time render engine which is basically like you create a video game and so that would allow us to create the room uh like because sorry i didn't really mention it but around this uh thing of like futurism they were into creating some kind of fake exhibition virtual exhibition around futurism that would include products but also inspiration like videos and catwalk and all of this and so you know you had one route which would be like creating a perfect exhibition with like redshift octane like cinema 4d and all of this but then we would be like fetishizing all the content and would be like taking so much care of every piece of lighting and all of this that I don't think that would have fit for in two weeks, especially given the amount of content they wanted to create. Or we could create this world where then you just have to put the camera everywhere and it's just, you know, like the, the rendering time of exporting a frame is literally zero because you have 60 frames per second versus 30 minutes per frame with, you know, with Octane. And so um, got excited about this. So we did like a lot of art direction research um, around the, you know, what could be the silhouette that wears the clothes and also what could be the, the exhibition space. Um, so those were like some, some ideas. We really un we understand quickly that if we want to do something that's not too boring, we had to play with scale. Um, so those were like different ideas about uh, how to make this uh, exhibition space a little interesting, especially because they had video to display, uh, which were which was like I think there were a lot of catwalks uh, videos mainly. Um, and then then we worked on the silhouettes because they had the product and we we're creating some silhouettes, and so we ended up with basically I was like literally styling. Uh, some silhouettes using the product that they were giving to us. And so those were like early stage uh, tests. Um, and then slowly and slowly, I, I just showed the process because I think it's kind of interesting to see, you know, where it comes from. And, you know, when you do 3D, you always have this uncanny moment at the beginning where it really doesn't look good and you're a little scared. But then... Uh, time I experience told me that I mean showed me that you know you just have to work a bit more and then it's getting better and better and better um, and so yeah here is like you know uh, there was it was not there yet uh, but we were starting to understand how it could be nice to have some spherical screens 
And then um, we worked with uh, VR to create those, you know, those kind of muddy almost um, to sculpt in VR to make those muddy characters. And that's a typical, typically this kind of moment where you're like, okay, I think we have something there because we have this very non-realistic um, <clears throat> character that can basically wear everything uh, that could wear glasses, but we also have gloves and all of this. And so I think that was kind of the break, the breakthrough of the of the project, and then started building everything. So those were my my Google sheet to basically uh, produce all the different objects that was in the because there were like four weeks for exhibition rooms that has that had to be kind of different and showing different products. Uh, here I can show um, I think here the plan was. <laughs> So when when you when I work with Goat, it's really nice because we always work with Figma. Everyone is working on Figma, so it's kind of messy in a way, but also with like very short timeline, it's kind of nice to to be able to to just uh, communicate in that way. And you can see here here the master plan in the way we we created everything. So we have like the product for each week, and then the looks. We were trying like different looks, and then we were having like those were like some art direction stuff but here we started like i started making some plans top view um like blueprint let's say of the of the rooms and so we were like basically doing like the breakdown of like what needs to happen in which room and some inspiration of like you know how how um how which kind of chair like this is like a rico wentz chair so it was very open that's one uh, one really interesting thing with the guys from goat is that you're basically part of the team at some point and you just can be like okay i ha i have this friend he has like a model of a uh, rico wentz shoes should we put it and we just like you know do it like this and so those were all the the yeah all the different maps and then yeah, and then so that's the the outcome is uh, so we so because in the selection of products there were those gloves by I think it was undercover I can't remember if it was undercover gentle no, yeah probably undercover uh, with even uh, with um, I can't remember the brand but anyways and they were like diff they had different colors and so we just found a way to make in Unreal Engine this character that uh, that moves with and you can only see the hands. And so we created those videos and they used it as the main promotional. I mean, you have like landscape version as well where they, that they could have on desktop for the campaign. And so, yeah, we created those like basically um, run through of the gallery through the point of view of the character. Um, I was really inspired by, I think the Serpentine Gallery did something like this with cows where you could see the cows, you know, the artist's um, character. Uh, walking around the Serpentine Gallery, and it was like I, I felt like super. I think they did this with Fortnite. I mean, kind of a, was kind of a collab or something, and that was yeah. I think what triggered the idea. Uh, so you can see here the look, one of the look. <clears throat> we and basically uh, here then from there, what I discovered pretty quickly is that with Unreal Engine, although it's like a video game render engine, you can also export pretty good looking three D, not at the level of um what could do like octane or anything but you can you know if you have to like export like very sh like a lot of a lot of content in a very short time it's actually pretty pretty good and so those were the different um the different images that we exported uh and then this is in the app uh the goat app because actually goat is mainly mainly mostly famous for their for their mobile app and so we could create those uh those editorials where you could shop the different um pieces uh, of the exhibition. Those were the social contents. And yeah. That was a very short and fun project that involved uh, yeah, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, I would say um, a lot of hopes because uh, with a uh, yeah it was it was, uh, was um, yeah we had we had to have a vision at some point because there was a pretty pretty um, intense uh, production. Um, and then another project, which actually is launching today or tomorrow, is this um, very different, which I think is interesting because you can see the, I think the two very different things that I'm working on, which is 3D on one side and interface on another side. Um, so this Essential Goods is a name of the an exhibition happening in Ukraine, in Kiev, um, in, this, uh, in this building. 
And so I think it, it features 24 Ukrainian uh, photographers. And so obviously the challenge of this exhibition is that not, not a lot of people are going to come to see the actual exhibition physically um, because of what's happening. And so the website was um, um, an important piece of communication. And you can see here the building. Um, and so Antoine, uh, Antoine Roux, who's a friend and also a designer, uh, he has a, um, a studio called Bureau Antoine Roux that maybe you know uh, his work. Um, he's the one who actually designed the DVTK's um, identity and websites. And he brought me on the project. He was contacted by those guys who were uh, creating the, the exhibition. And he was dealing with everything that has to do with uh, the scenography. And I would do the digital. And then Tristan Bago, a developer, would do the uh, the development. In reality, it's, we kind of did every day of everything, right? Um, but yeah, that was um, obviously like a pro bono project that we did on the on the sides. Uh, so we didn't like spend um, like a tremendous amount of time, especially because again, it was like a very short timeline. But you can see here the um, the the kind of picture, like the photography um that was being showcased um and then those were like some early stage inspiration for the scenography and the the whole idea was to create this kind of you know um structure an invisible structure uh a bit inspired by the facade of the building and to attach the um, to attach the um, the work and the photography in reality, there were some budget constraints for the scenography, and I'm not sure exactly how it's going on at the moment because they're building it right now, or they've been building it. I've seen some images, but I think we couldn't really make it so that it was like th those beautiful uh, steel wires. But then we that was definitely still the the, the inspiration for the websites, and I really like the. Uh, I started like you know thinking about how. You know, in when you're in exhi an exhibition, you're the person who can um, create the sense of 3D, and you can uh, get close to an image, and then the image that is at the back becomes very small, and this is something that naturally happens when you're visiting a gallery. But that's not something that that's that's obviously that you have you can also recreate in digital by really playing with scale, and so you can create like extreme basically a contrast uh, of scale. And those were some inspiration also of like, you know, how to use grid and images. And so I started at the very beginning, I was starting to make like some animation with like, how can we have a grid and then also some some lines that attach them together. But then it becomes it became kind of clear that we didn't really like the idea that those lines were here and not there and moving around because it felt like the exhibition, it felt almost like the structure was not solid. And we really wanted for this exhibition to feel like this is grounded, right? So um, we we explored like other other type of of layouts, um, and then I think one of the breakthrough here, one when we started really you know you know following the inspiration, playing with scale, and then I think that was a great moment where we're starting to be okay. Then uh, starts to be interesting the way the images respect each other almost and have enough of space to have their own aura. Um, the, here I have some, yeah, here. And so then I started playing with like how this grid can um, appear and disappear, but more with like the interaction. So here I click. And uh, actually at that time I was learning to, uh, to use Figma also. So it was a great way to play around with prototypes. And it was pretty, pretty, pretty enjoyable actually. Um, and so I discovered like, you know, how to, how to do all of this. And then I think one interesting thing then was like, okay, how can you create a path between, between the different images? And so here you can see, I think you can see it better on the, on that one where, you know, you can have a grid that actually attach and link, uh, images together. Um, and so then we are we were thinking of an Easter egg where maybe when you leave and you go back on the website, you only have the names of the artists. And I think the layout was pretty interesting here. Um, and working as well with um, 
with uh, how to reveal the images with a little bit of 3D that, and then the 3D doesn't have to doesn't have to stay it doesn't have to be like fully 3D because I think you know I've been working on a lot of uh, website with 3D at least I, I guess that's basically kind of you know that's linked also to the lesson I learn um which is that um you know especially when you want to respect the content especially for photographers it's always very annoying when you like you know you, you must have seen a lot of like virtual exhibition showing work and especially flat work and i think it's always very annoying when you when you see it like it's, it's like slightly shifted and you cannot see it properly and it's it's a bit of a shame because the premise of trying to do like a 3D exhibition is to do something even better and even more interesting and even more immersive. And eventually, if everyone is being honest with the experience, it's just less good. It's less good than just a basic slideshow. And so the idea there was to not try to do like some kind of virtual 3D, um, you know, uh, exhibition where the work would be like some, some would have some weird skewed, um, Par parallax, uh, not parallax, but like uh, perspectives. And so uh, one middle path here was to have some kind of uh, opening where you see the images coming out from some kind of 3D space, but then they just flat and then you can just enjoy the work of the photographers as we should, yeah, you know. Um, so then we ping-ponged with uh, Antoine Roux and then this is kind of an an evolution of the website where you see the navigation at the top and the 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 grid has become a little gray to a bit uh, to be a to have the work uh, stand out more um and then uh you know some other and this is a website that actually I cannot I think I can show you yeah the staging link but actually it's there um can you still see yeah um so it's being built so I think in the future, we will actually pan with just moving the cursor. So we don't have to drag and drop necessarily, but you can see here how we, so it has to launch tomorrow. So, you know, uh, hopefully we'll get there and then you can click and you have the slideshow. Uh, I think you have the bio like this. So yeah, that's that's the um, like the freshest project uh, I'm working on right now. And then, yeah, I think that's uh, that's it for the work. I mean, I have other stuff, obviously, but I think that's that's already uh, um, a good uh, a good bit. Um, well, that was that was great. Obviously, being aware of your work from before when you had your previous agency, um, I think the questions that I had based upon my knowledge of that are very different to what I have now. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm gonna ask a really basic question. Um, when you, because I think you said Unreal Engine, is that what you were saying? Yeah, Unreal Engine, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So what, what was the learning curve like when you moved from kind of, because was it the first time that you had experienced even playing around with it? So you had to learn that whilst also having a three-week timeline. So that's a great question because I think something that I didn't actually talk about was the way I work, um, like concretely. Um, there are a lot of stuff that I can do by myself, but there are. But um, when I started DVTK, I was uh, I was working with Kim, uh, the other partner. She's she was um, creating the interfaces, and I was focusing on animation in three D and art direction. And so, and we are creating the concepts together. Let's say, but the more we worked on project, and the bigger the project were, I think my work, my my role started uh, being more of a like a movie director. <laughs> Like mm -hmm. the biggest chunk of the work was actually hiring the right people for the right skills. And that has led me to do a lot of mistakes um, because hiring is actually one of the toughest things that I've been doing. Actually, I had to read, read books about it because I was like, how can I get it so wrong? And, you know, you, you then you realize that how when you hire, you actually project what you want on the person. And so you constantly like doing mistakes. And and also, you know, you, you try to force someone into something that the person doesn't just doesn't know how to do or never did before. And so there is this. Yeah, I guess that that is the that, that was the, the toughest thing. But now I think I had a lot of experience doing it. So when I started um, thinking, OK, maybe I have to do some stuff on Unreal Engine. I contacted two persons who I knew were working with Unreal Engine, and that links me to something else, which is that 
the more I understood that as a director, I had to hire the right people for the right skills, the more it came very clear that I had to meet people, talents all the time, all year to make sure that when I need something, I don't have to look for it because I already have it somewhere. And so now I have a ledger of probably a thousand people, to be honest, from sound designer to strategist to to like real time to Shopify developers to like everything. And so luckily, I mean, actually, the idea of doing a real giant came from the fact that I knew that I could find those people, I had those people that I could work with. Um, and so my I what happened in the learning curve, I mean, I just bought a new Mac because I just couldn't run Unreal Engine in a proper way on my older Mac. So that was the first move. And that because I really wanted to be able to navigate with the camera, but really my work there was more about um, direction and production, to be honest, like basically following my Google sheet and being like, oh, you have to do this or that. And also the, all, the whole conversation of, you know, uh, just as a director, I guess, with the producer, I mean, in the movie, uh, movie context, I guess it was like uh, more, I have some feedback from GOAT and they are, you know, as with any client, they can be pretty disruptive sometimes. And how can I, you know, <laughs> make it happen with the team? And then um, because I have a 3D background, I actually did a lot of debugging uh, on like many 3D objects that was not, were not right. And that's also something where, you know, hiring is pretty difficult because Today, I think people are very are highly specialized. And so they can be super good at doing like, I don't know, um, Unreal Engine typically, but not at all to do modeling. And so then it becomes some kind of, you know, because you don't have either the budget or the time to just have like uh, 20 people working for you. I think it's it, can, it, it comes as very handy, the fact that I'm, I was a generalist myself in 3D because then I was just doing a lot of hard work on myself, um, by myself with Maya, because that's the software I use. But uh, yeah, the learning, yeah, the the actually that, that's how it happened. So basically, it it happened because I hired people to do it. <laughs> that makes sense. I I tried once to to learn how to use Maya. And ah, the, the the older you get, the more difficult it is to work that out. That software is really difficult even in the first place. Yeah, that's why I spent three years of my life doing it day and night. <laughs> but um. <laughs> I wouldn't recommend to start with Maya for sure. It, today, it only it it only makes sense for Pixar or for like a big, you know, like you know. But actually, you just have to use Blender today or Cinema 4D. Yeah, I don't, I don't think I was using it for the right reasons. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So the the interestingly that you brought up some of the old, old IKEA um, magazines, and obviously in your early influences, furniture was such a key inspiration for you. Um, as you kind of evolve your practice to, to focus specifically on digital, how do you try to still retain a sense of that kind of like tangible, tactile kind of uh, quality that you get from examining a piece of furniture in a th in in a three D space? Do you do you ever find kind of like the or do you ever have the urge to try and make uh, kind of like match or mix up the two mediums so that you can bring and merge the digital and the physical together? So I think that would be my dream, actually, to be able to mer merge more uh, the physical world and the digital world. The reality is that I've been uh, my entire life the poorest person in terms of DIY, anything. Like my hands are just not made made for that. And so I feel like that could happen. I, I could merge if things, if I could learn it from someone. But I just, I, th I think it just never happened. The, the closest to um, physical the physical world that I got with is with my with my I have a, a a side project called Encore, which is like an art label, and we're doing merch. And so I learned I was very specific on the fact that I wanted to learn to do the six the screen printing myself, just because for me it was the you know the like I yeah that was kind of you know my side quest um, for my life, you know being able to be more and more uh, let's say physical. Uh, I, I think that uh, the, the inspiration from architecture, though, I, 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 you, you can definitely make some parallels between uh, websites and digital design and architecture mm -hmm. from the simple fact that it's all about navigation. It's all about like someone like a visitor, uh, even the way we used to talk about the Internet in the in. I mean, even today you have the home page. So it's a home. And so everything is about architecture. Everything is about uh, some we always use parallel of. Yeah, of what what's happening in the physical world. I, I think it's mostly for 
technology adoption because we don't like to adopt anything that we don't really understand. So I think at that time, they were just using those words for us to understand. The same way we're using the word phone for an iPhone, which actually, you know, you never really use it. I mean, you use it not so much as a phone, but for everything else. Mm -hmm. But, you know, so... <clears throat> Uh, I think in that in that sense, uh, the idea of uh, navigating and creating surprises, and uh, I think that's I would say that's the biggest link that I have with architecture, and and also, but the main thing was I think about, you know, um, how to um, how to create an environment that 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 you know you, there is nothing that makes me more sad than a sad building. And there is nothing that makes me more sad than a sad website template. And I think, you know, that's more the way I kind of make the parallel. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, well, it's, it's, it's interesting because I remember seeing um, an article, I don't know how many years ago it was, it must have been around five or six years ago, where there was a, a digital designer working with Kanye West to try mm -hmm. and reimagine what an e-commerce experience looks like. I don't know if you ever remember this example, but it felt no. like of an e-com which is basically selected and now it feels a lot more kind of we see it a lot more but back then the idea of almost gamifying the whole ideal principle of e-com which if you think about the retail environment there's a lot of people a lot of brands who are significantly braver about converting a retail space into an experience but when when you're working with these large-scale brands there is a reluctance to want to redevelop or reimagine what e-com looks like purely through the through the the idea that things have to physically convert um you know like ultimately any brand the majority of brands anyway that you speak to if their sole reliance on their uh, revenue comes through their ability for their website to convert the opportunity to really push the boundaries of e-com becomes a lot more limited. So have you ever worked within a medium that allows you to try and balance the two? Well, <clears throat> that's, uh, you know, um, in the early days of DVTK, we were always saying like, you know, um, today you have luxury brands. Let's take Louis Vuitton, for instance. Uh, th their e-com looks like a supermarket. And uh, on the other end, you have their brick and mortar shop that look ama looked amazing. Why don't they put as much effort in the e-com than uh, on their brick and mortar shop? But then, so we did like a, some e-commerce where we tried to challenge that by creating like a landing page where you arrive and there is like some 3D things going on. We did like this e-com for Hanger, like a London brand, uh, a lot of lat latex stuff. And so it was also like Japanese inspired, Japan inspired. And so when you were landing, you had like 3D, um, so it's from 3D building and the billboards on those buildings, they could be changed from the CMS, from the admin system. And so the basically the landing page was the city with the billboard and the billboard was showing the, 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 the latest campaign of the, of the brand. We've done that many times. And what we realized uh, was unfortunate, which is that when you do this kind of website, it only lasts a year. Some brands do need this website because they are they are very niche. Uh, they actually not famous at all. They just start, and so they need to stand out, or they think they need to stand out. Mm -hmm. And then you do this website, and after a year, they are like, you know what? I just want a normal website I, because I just want to sell, you know. Mm -hmm. And because the reality, and I I can see it now with my label, like I'm selling T-shirts, and the reality is that you see the conversion, and you just like make it more simple and more simple and more simple. It just converts better, and so it's. It's a tricky. It's a tricky thing. I feel. I feel like that's. Uh, you know, you were asking in the <clears throat> the breakdown of questions for the call about like the key the key uh, lesson uh, uh, that I learned, and I think one big um, big lesson for me is that for the first one is design is not art, and I think that was the biggest confusion when I was uh, young because as you can see, I was my references were actually not even industrial design. My references were artists who be who were doing design as their mode of expression. Mm -hmm. And that was actually that confused me for a long time because I was trying to, to like that any website would be unique and would be like a whole experience and all of this. But, I just, but, I, I, but at, at some point, you, you, I just realized that the, the very nature of art is that art is not applicable and that's the beauty of it. And wh why we call Applied art, applied art is because they are applied on a real, uh, like an on, on a industry 
um, um, context. Mm -hmm. And I think this is for me the, you know, like I, I totally understand the, the idea of um, wanting for the, um, the, the next, you know, generation of ex shopping experience to be like all 3D or like, you know, to be mimicking somehow what, what can happen on in the physical world. But uh, in reality, I think we are limited by the device we use because we are still on the laptop. That could happen maybe with Vision Pro uh, at Apple. Uh, and I don't, I'm not even sure, but maybe it was some kind of immersive device that could happen. But I tend to think that every medium has its own essence and substance and that you cannot do one thing. You cannot just you know mimic uh, something from one uh, medium and just put it in another one. And so, and I'm saying this being the one who really tried to unlock the the Z axis of interfaces for such a long time, and so, and I, and today I actually enjoy just having my little grid that is just you know moving around for this exhibition, uh, uh, photo exhibition website, and I'm like, this is the world to me. You know, that's enough. Actually, there is the middle path. I think you do it super well with your own website with the XX. You know, like mm -hmm. imagine if like the your whole portfolio was only like this thing, like with 3D everywhere. But actually you do it super well because you arrive, you land, you see it's advanced. It's like super nice and, you know, uh, a bold statement as a brand, uh, as a brand. But then it's just it just um, fades out and then you can enjoy the website and the reason why you came here, you know. Yeah. And I think this is, this is the middle path that I think is you know, being mature about your, I mean, this is what I learned, basically, I think. It's interesting. It, 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 cause it, as, a, as a creative, I suppose your, your mind always wants to wander towards doing something more expressive. But ultimately, when you're working with clients, a lot of the time, if you have to really determine what the purpose of the medium you're working with is, ultimately, it ends up limiting your creative yeah. kind of opportunity. I, I could have a conversation with you for hours, but I'm also conscious that I don't know what time it is actually. It's five to six. So, mm -hmm. um, but I really appreciate your time. As I said, it's it's a real pleasure to have you on because I've appreciated your work uh, from afar for a long while. So I really appreciate you taking uh, your time out to speak with us. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening. You're more than And welcome. thank you for the conversation. That was great. Thank you. Have a lovely evening. Bye-bye.